Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. For anyone who isn't caught up on all of Twin Peaks, there will be spoilers in this video, so viewers and listeners be warned. And let's just jump right into it. Here are my top 25 picks for the best moments from the new Twin Peaks. Number 25. Dougie, just think, if you hadn't blown that money gambling, 25,000 plus the insurance, we could have gotten you a great new car. But now, who knows what we'll get. Like the Spike's failed assassination attempt had it all. A calculated sneak attack, a couple of karate chops, a fired up Janie E, and a creepy tree for good measure. <laughs> this was the first time we saw Cooper's instincts in action, and he did not disappoint. Cooper not only managed to thwart Ike's attack, but he also protected his wife in the process. Victim? Oh no, that guy didn't act like any victim. Douglas Jones, he moved like a cobra. Number 24. The look on Tony's face when he first witnessed the conga line was priceless. There they were. Cooper, the Mitchum brothers, the showgirl trio, all merrily parading around the office. They came bearing gifts for battling Bud Mullins, and this entire sequence left me laughing like a complete idiot. And the keys to your new car! <laughs> yeah, a BMW convertible. Now you and Dougie have a match set. I am speechless. It would have been bad enough for Tony to just see Cooper and the Mitchum brothers together in any capacity. But a fired up conga line undoubtedly meant that his plan had gone to complete shit. A wrong has been made right, and the sun is shining bright. <laughs> uh, thank you, fellas. Number 23. How much money did we get? $72. The scene where scumbag Steven and Becky get high is one of the few tributes to the original series with regards to the theme of troubled youth. Becky is young, and she's beautiful, but she's also naive and seems willfully oblivious to her current predicament. Did you take all of that today? Yeah. Well, why? Why wouldn't I? We learned so much about these characters from this quick glimpse into their lives, and while Norma and Shelley look on disapprovingly, Becky and Steven cower away, both literally and figuratively, as they surrender to the temporary escape and pleasures provided by drugs like Laura before them. Number 22. Hmm. That insurance, fuck, it's after midnight. That oily bastard. I can throw a car farther than I trust that rat fuck. When Tony tries to trick the brothers Mitchum, time and time again the brothers call upon Candy services. And she's oblivious each and every time this happens. And amazingly, the Mitchum brothers look shocked by this every single time. Watching the Mitchum brothers grow more and more perturbed with her is absolutely sublime. What the fuck? Did we ask her to tell him her life story? Come for four fucking hours? And then when Tony finally does get the chance to serve up his con, it only acts to amplify this already wonderful scene. Tremendous. You have an enemy! And Douglas Jones. Number 21. Dougie, do you find me attractive? I thought David Lynch had masterfully created the perfect sex scene in Mulholland Drive, but I was wrong, because Lynch topped that beautiful effort with what was perhaps the funniest sex scene in the history of movies and television. It all started innocently enough, with Cooper enjoying some cake oblivious to Janie E.'s pre-game advances, and the next thing you know, Coop's arms are flopping around helplessly like a Muppet. Ducky! 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 
Number 20. I just spoke with Nadine. She's given me my freedom. Ed, I'm, I'm so sorry. Walter's here. What better way to follow up humorous sex than with true love finally realized? Ed seemed as dejected as ever, as if this had been the final straw of their topsy-turvy relationship. It seemed as if things were going to end badly for poor Ed, but Norma flipped the script and unexpectedly exercised her option. And at long last, Ed and Norma were finally given the opportunity to be together. This was a lovely moment in a series otherwise surrounded by darkness. I love you. I love you. I love you with all my heart. Number 19. What would you do, Richard? I check out the two that match. You're a very bright young man. And we're very close to the two that match. Watching Bad Coop and Richard driving around in silence acted as the calm before the storm. At first, it almost appeared as if Bad Coop was about to bond with Richard in some sort of new union of evil. But in fact, Bad Coop was merely using Richard to activate any would-be traps. I'm 25 years your senior. Take this and get on up there. And his foresight and precaution paid big dividends while poor Jerry Horn was stuck watching on from afar with his bad binoculars. Goodbye, my son. Bad binoculars! Bad, bad, bad binoculars! Bad. Number 18. Hello, and guest Clover. You can go out now. The lodge scene between Agent Cooper and Laura Palmer revisited a lot of familiar ground, but it was the uncharted territory from their dialogue that acted as a springboard for newer and more complex mysteries. Hi, um, Laura Palmer. But Laura Palmer is dead. With the advantage of hindsight, this scene is even more intriguing and mind-boggling than it already was. And that speaks volumes here. The fates of Laura and Cooper were always somehow closely connected and intertwined, and this scene was pivotal in taking that to the next level. <laughs> Number 17. What do I get if I win? <laughs> You'll be our boss. I don't want to be your boss. But if I win, I want him. The beauty of the arm wrestling scene is that Lynch completely turned the tables on the audience. Prior to this, Bad Coop was always portrayed as the villain personifying evil. But during the entire buildup for the arm wrestling match, we're suddenly in a position where most observers found themselves actually cheering for the bad guy. It was brilliantly executed, and you just knew that Renzo was gonna get his ass kicked. That was from the nursery school teacher. I still find it baffling that Ray was willing to go along with the terms of this unusual contest. But it sure was fun watching his facial expressions as he began to realize that Bad Coop was merely toying with Renzo. Powerhouse. Doesn't that hurt your arm when I go like that? I think it's much worse when it's down here. Number 16. Oh my god! Oh my god! When Bill Hastings took Mackley and Cole's team to the zone, it had all types of brilliant Lynchian weirdness going on. A creeping woodsman, Gordon Cole on the brink of the vortex, a vision of dirty bearded men, Albert pulling Cole to safety, the headless corpse of Ruth Davenport, a cigarette-smoking tulpa, and ultimately, the demise of Hastings himself. What the hell happened, Mackley? He 
He's dead. Number 15. Hello, Johnny. How are you today? Hello, Johnny. How are you today? Richard Horn was already a hopelessly irredeemable character at this point in the story, so seeing him assault and rob his own grandmother wasn't all that surprising. At the same time, the scene still succeeded in being dreadfully uncomfortable. The sight of poor Johnny watching on helplessly as Richard attacked his mother, the repetitious sounds coming from Johnny's creepy toy, the vile behavior of Richard, and the terrified pain and anguish suffered by Sylvia all combined to make this a disturbingly memorable moment. Oh, don't come any closer, Richard. I mean it. Money, Grandma. No. Hello, Johnny. How are you today? Oh, Johnny. Oh. Number 14. Here's to Billy. Ladies and gentlemen, Audrey's Dance. After Charlie and Audrey finally got situated at the roadhouse, things started with an awkward toast. Next thing you know, Audrey is the center of attention, and she soon finds herself doing her dreamy dance of seduction like only she can. Charlie is studying her, the crowd is swaying along, and Audrey is doing her thing and finding her groove. Unfortunately, the fun all comes to a sudden end when one scumbag smashes another scumbag in the face with a bottle. This terrifies our beloved Audrey during what wound up being her final on-screen appearance. Get me out of here! What? 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 Number 13. When I first saw Senorita Dito chilling out on the couch listening to tunes, I thought to myself, that looks like the place where we saw the giant. And sure enough, holy shit, there he is, hiding behind that big mechanical alarm thingy. The giant's in no hurry, though, and he eventually makes his way to the big screen where he sees the mother coughing up a bunch of evil eggs. In response to this, the giant begins to float before producing a golden orb that appears to contain the essence of Laura Palmer. And Senorita Dito is mighty pleased by this. This sequence delivered a great abundance of magic and was also accompanied by a beautifully mesmerizing musical score. Number 12. The entire casino sequence, which stretches across parts three and four, was nothing short of genius. From the moment Jade shoved Cooper out of the car, right up until he receives his winnings, this sequence was simply glorious. Lancelot Court, your house has the red door. That's how I always find it. Near Merlin's Market, it's not far from here. Far from here. No, not far from here. It's maybe a six or eight dollar cab ride. Cooper's on the prowl in Vegas. He's wandering around aimlessly winning all kinds of jackpots. We meet the mean old lady. We get to see Bill Shaker and his lovely wife, Candy. And overall, it's just such a bizarre and merry experience. Thank you, Mr. Jackpot. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jackpot. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Number 11. 253 yards due east. And we have to put some soil in our pockets. Jack Rabbit's palace was a moment that received a lot of attention and buildup. Major Briggs left very specific instructions along with various other cryptic hints hidden in a very unusual device. You just knew something crazy was going to happen when they finally all arrived there. And the scene delivered big time. We got the return of the eyeless woman... We got another vortex, and holy shit, Andy's with the giant. Andy is with the giant. I am the fair man. 
And the giant shows Andy a really cool sequence of visions in a little movie. The fact that the fireman shows Andy was a creative stroke of absolute genius. She's very important, and there are people that want her dead. She's fine physically. We need to put her in a cell where she'll be safe. Okay. Number 10. You drinking all alone tonight? Mind your own business. Please. That's not very polite. It wasn't meant to be polite. When Sarah Palmer entered the bar and ordered herself a Bloody Mary, you could just tell some really weird shit was about to go down. Enter the scumbag sporting the Truck U shirt. Despite bringing his A-game, this guy's advances were quickly shot down by Sarah. But this lowlife just couldn't take a hint, and he quickly became rude and belligerent. You like to eat cunt, huh? I'll eat you. <laughs> what? I kill you, will you miserable bitch? But Spooky Sarah had the last laugh when she exposed her inner darkness before biting the scumbag trucker's throat. Do you really want to fuck with this? Number nine. Agent Cooper's time spent in the realm of non-existence was a shining exhibit of surreal Lynchian art. The dark and mysterious imagery contains so many powerhouse elements. The vast purple ocean. The eyeless woman feeling up Cooper's face. The shocking demise of the eyeless woman. The giant floating head of Major Briggs. And the anxious words of an American girl who looked an awful lot like Ronette Pulaski. And then there were all the horrific sounds of dread that led to an omnipresent sense of doom. This is just one of many examples where the whole of the sequence was greater than the sum of its individual parts. And the individual parts kicked a lot of ass in their own right. Number eight. Looks like you're out half a million. Well, I think you're wrong about that. Tricked you, fucker. This scene literally seemed to materialize out of nowhere. Ed Coop and Ray are driving around after leaving the jail, and the build-up here gave one the sense that Ray wasn't long for this world. But then the script was suddenly flipped, and Ray was the one who had tricked and gunned down Bad Coop. This was entirely unexpected, and the shock value was tremendous. But before we even had time to properly absorb what we just witnessed, a bunch of creepy-ass woodsmen emerged from out of nowhere, and they started doing their thing. Bob's essence surfaced, Ray panicked and fled, and after a musical number from the Nine Inch Nails, Bad Coop was resurrected. Powerhouse. <laughs> Number seven. You know, Dougie's talking with a lot of assurance. Maybe something to do with the coma? Side effects. That inevitable moment when the real Cooper finally returned would soon be followed by an emotionally powerful farewell when Cooper parted ways with Janie E and Sonny Jim. The duo looked absolutely horrified when Cooper broke the news. You're my dad. I'm your dad, Sonny Jim. I'm your dad. And I love you. I love you both. You could literally feel their pain and heartache during this magical moment, and you could sense their sorrow as they watched on helplessly, alone and dejected. It was a brilliantly executed scene that succeeded in directly connecting the audience with the emotions of the abandoned family. Whoever you 
Number six. You're in my driveway. We're not in your driveway. We're not even close to your fucking driveway, asshole. Go fuck yourself! Hutch and Chantel were skilled assassins, but you knew they would ultimately fail in their mission to kill Cooper. The manner in which they failed, however, was nothing short of epic. The emergence of the disgruntled accountant was certainly an unexpected twist, but it paid glorious dividends almost instantly. Ah, 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 winged me! This shit is fucking up the whole thing! Ah. Get us the fuck out of here! Watching their demise unfold was violent and gruesome, and yet ultimately fulfilling and satisfying. The fact that the deadliest duo in the long list of Cooper's would-be assassins were ultimately stopped by a fired-up accountant with an inclination towards road rage was nothing short of pure bliss. What the fuck kind of neighborhood is this? People are under a lot of stress, Bradley. Number five. The build-up to Cooper's first sip of coffee in 25 years was an uplifting experience all around. Cooper comes in looking ridiculous with his tie on his head, Sonny Jim is smiling, Janie E is cooking up a storm, and Cooper has no idea what to do. Fortunately for him, Sonny Jim is quite amused by Cooper's bewildered state, and Sonny Jim helps him to his seat and even pours some syrup on his pancakes. The look of joy on Cooper's face taking his first bite of food was priceless in its own right, but what came next was inexplicably awesome. Doggy! Ah. Hi! Number four. Got a light? Got a light? Part 8 was one of the most enjoyable hours of television I ever had the pleasure of experiencing. And I think this episode generally got exponentially better as it moved along. By the time we reached the parts from 1956, things had gotten so good that it's downright frightening. From the hatching of the frogger moth, to the woodsman harassing that nice couple, the innocence of a youthful first kiss... The lovely song that was playing in the background, the violent skull crushing, and then there's the dangling unlit cigarette and the dark and mysterious poem of entrancement. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full, and this end. And of course, the lovely young lass finally swallowing the frog moth. This entire sequence was a wonderful work of art, the likes of which we may very well never see again. On life. On life. With the world far away. Number three. What's going on? It's difficult to explain. As strange as it sounds, I think you're a girl named Laura Palmer. I had no idea how Twin Peaks was going to end, but in my wildest dreams, I never could have imagined something that would end so perfectly. From the moment Carrie Page first appeared on screen, right up until the very end when we hear her screaming, it was absolutely perfect. Normally, somebody like you comes around and I tell him to fuck off. Cooper's insistence on meddling in affairs and trying to change Laura's fate led us to believe that he had some type of a master plan. But the reality was, Cooper was baffled. He didn't know what the hell was going on. And watching Carrie Page, slowly but surely, take on more and more of the subtle mannerisms of Laura Palmer was fantastic. Simply perfect. What year is this?
Number two. You are weak. One hundred percent. Finally. When Cooper finally woke up, it was arguably the most triumphant moment in the rich history of television. The anticipation and the build-up to this moment resulted in a tremendous payoff of triumphant proportions. Agent Cooper was back, and he didn't waste any time springing to action. Bushnell, pass me some of those sandwiches. I'm starving. The other just called. The FBI was then looking for you. Perfect. He immediately had some sandwiches, got his vitals checked, asked Janie E to get the car, he armed himself with Bud's gun, he got the Mitchum brothers to gas up their jet, and he left a message for Gordon Cole. He also had a very touching moment with battling Bud that exuded a vintage Twin Peaks vibe. Holy shit. Cooper was back. You're a fine man, Bush No Mullins. I will not soon forget your kindness and decency. What about the FBI? I am the FBI. Number one. If he's got this one certain thing that's in that box, it means we can't kill him. Why? It means he's not our enemy, Rodney. It all started with Cooper entering the limo with that big old box. The Mitchum brothers seemed hell-bent on eliminating their perceived enemy, Douglas Jones, but Bradley had a weird dream that gave him second thoughts. And when the moment of truth arrived, Bradley again hesitated. What was in that big old box from Bradley's dream? Holy shit, it was a cherry pie. And look at that, a check for $30 million. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Holy. I love this guy. And then it just got better and better from there. The Mitchum brothers loved Cooper now, even if they couldn't understand why his son had no gym set. We got to see the return of the sweet, mean old lady with the Mitchum brothers looking on approvingly like proud parents. And best of all was seeing Cooper eat that slice of cherry pie and the ultimate reaction from Bradley. Mm. Can you? Can you? Another piece of pie for our friend. I could watch these moments on loop all day long. Just look at the brilliance. For me, this was by far the greatest moment from the return. This scene really kicked a lot of ass. No gym set. No gym set. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Even a fucking orphanage had a gym set. Every kid should have a gym set. So there you have it. In my personal opinion, these were the 25 greatest moments from the new Twin Peaks. But this is just my opinion, and had I created this list on another day, who knows how differently it might look, especially on the back end. There were just so many wonderful scenes that it's difficult to choose. So my apologies to so many other scenes that I absolutely loved. Like the scene with Betty Briggs. The scene with Doc Hayward and Sheriff Truman. Cooper's first day of work in the green tea latte. Bobby, Shelley, and Becky in the diner. The Monica Bellucci dream. Several scenes with Bad Coop in prison. The Philip Jeffries appearances. Cole's vision of Laura Palmer. And so many other awesome parts, including the moment where Cooper merrily explained to Janie E. Jade. Jade. So that's her name, is it? Jade give two rides. I'll bet she did. So... What were your favorite moments from the new Twin Peaks? Please share your thoughts in the comments section, and let me know what you think of my selection. In conclusion, to reiterate what I said after my last episode, what I love so much about the new Twin Peaks is that it has left me wanting more. I don't need more. I want more. And it doesn't ultimately matter if we get it or not. Because the desire of always wanting more 
is what makes the world of Twin Peaks so strange and wonderful. I'm just itching for more, but it's honestly the type of itch that no amount of scratching will ever suffice. That's all I got for now. Thank you for watching, everyone, and have a wonderful night.